Um, so as you all know, I love these. I love our Appalachia Partnership Consortium meetings because we get to talk about good stuff, uh, but we also get the opportunity to bring folks to you that I think impact your work, impact our work, uh, but we get to have a conversation with them. You know, I, I, you know, I always say that some of the people that we read about and that we think about uh, as, you know, being up there or over there that we can't talk to, I mean, I get excited that they're my friends, they're my colleagues, and we get to get, bring them here to chat with you. The first two people I want to introduce you to are Joey Longley. And Joey, you're going to talk a bit about what you do, uh, but then and I'm going to say that that's probably not what you really do. And then I'm going to talk about, talk to Regina. Regina, you're going to tell the people what you do, but I'm probably going to talk more about some of the bigger stuff that you, you've done and some of the, the I think the, the big impacts that you folks are having right now on opioid settlements, on opioid information, on opioid elimination uh, use in this country, 1115 waivers. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act. I want to talk about workforce development opportunities. I got a whole bunch of stuff I want to talk about around people with lived experience, about the relationship of uh, opioids uh, settlements and MAT providers and in the HIV continuum. I just want to talk to you a whole bunch. I hope you have coffee. I hope you have water. And I hope you've got a whole hour to give me because I'm still going to I'm still going to keep you on here for uh, to, to 10 minutes after the hour because I want to get my 10 minutes back because the people are going to probably have a bunch of questions for you. First and foremost, Regina, I'm going to go with you first because I've known you longer, not anything other than that. Uh, and so tell these people who you are, what you've done and what you do. Great. Thanks so much uh, for this discussion today, Tony. Appreciate it and appreciate being on with, with Joey Longley. Um, so I am an attorney by training. Uh, I haven't practiced in quite some time. I've been working in public policy for a long period of time. Uh, I served as the legal counsel to the mayor of Seattle um, for uh, almost a decade. Uh, came to DC um, and served in the Office of National Drug Control Policy uh, in the Obama administration for both terms. And then went back during the Biden administration and served as the acting director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, which is in the White House and it sets national. Can everybody go on mute? Can everybody go on mute? Thank you. Uh -huh. So we set you know, the nation's drug strategy. Um, and in the meantime, after I left the Obama administration, I was fortunate to receive a grant uh, to begin working at Georgetown University at the O'Neill Institute. And at O'Neill, we work at the intersection of public health and the law. Our specific initiative is focused on addiction. So um, evidence-based practices for people with substance use disorder or who are affected by substance use disorder. Uh, it's basically a think tank. We do a lot of research, writing, a lot of convenings. And then the other piece of my job at Georgetown is I am a professor and I direct the Master of Science in Addiction Policy and Practice Program. Huh. That master's program is a one-year program. We're in our third year. And the purpose of that program is really to train addiction policy professionals because so many people like myself included learned on the job and you know, we made a lot of mistakes along the way. And I really think that we wanted to professionalize the addiction policy workforce because this is a public health issue and we need trained people who can lead public policy going forward. So that's a little bit about uh, the work sure. that I do at Georgetown. Thanks, Joey. What you, I mean, I, uh, can you top that, Joey? What, what are you doing over there now at the, at the Office of National Drug Control Policy? I mean, you know, what are you doing? What are you up to? Hey, definitely can't top it, um, but thank you so much for having me anyway, Tony, um, and it's good to be here with Regina. Um, I am currently at the O'Neill Institute also uh, with Regina, working as a project director, but right, I came, I spent the last year um, at the Office of National Drug Control Policy, where I uh, worked on uh, the intersection of criminal justice and uh, drug policy, and um, worked on the criminal justice chapter of the National Drug Control Strategy. Uh, I came to that work um, as uh, coming uh, from a background of litigation. Um, so I uh, spent a few years at the ACLU uh, National Prison Project, 
uh, we, my main focus was on litigation that expands access to MOUD uh, in jails and in prisons. Uh, so when we started that work, there were only a, you know, a handful of jails and prisons across the country who were providing MOUD. And I got to work on cases uh, in Illinois and New Mexico uh, and in upstate New York where we got the third injunction in the nation that said that people have a right while they're incarcerated to have access to MOUD under the Americans with Disabilities Act and also under the Eighth Amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that was really exciting work. And today we're seeing, you know, many, many hundreds of jails that are providing access to MOUD, uh, not perfectly, and we're continuing to monitor that. Uh, but that's an exciting part of my work today at O'Neill, as Regina kind of laid out, is, you know, looking in a think tank world, thinking about the ways um, that policy can kind of link in with what litigators are doing, making sure that, uh, you know, uh, folks on the ground, uh, folks that are doing policy work, folks that are litigating, folks in government, uh, you know, can, to the extent appropriate, synergize and uh, move the ball forward as, as quickly as we can. So excited to be here. Perfect. Thanks. So well, let's, let's start, let's start with the big one, right? So one of the things it seems that uh, and it seems, but is a part of the Office of the National Drug Control Policy Initiative is kind of getting these 1115 waivers uh, over the over the goal line, particularly before November, right? Uh, I think we want to see more of that. Can you, for folks that are new to this space, but true to this space, can you tell them what an 1115 waiver is? Either one of you. What is it supposed to do? And why do we need to have a big push right now? Uh, so who wants to go first? I'll, I'll give a big picture and then. Uh, so um, the 1115 waivers are uh, allowed under the Affordable Care Act. And what they do is they allow states to experiment with Medicaid funding. Um, 1115 waivers are supposed to be budget neutral. States have to apply to um, CMS to the federal government to get them approved. Um, and in this case, uh, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll defer to Joey on the other details of this. In this case, um, this allows 1115 waivers for the reentry waivers allow for federal Medicaid funds to be spent in jails and prisons um, 90 days before someone re-enters the community, because there is a law that does not allow allow for federal Medicaid funds to be spent once someone's incarcerated. Hmm. So let me uh, turn it back to Joey and see if he wants to flush that out more. Hmm. Um, so I think you know one of the really important features of this 1115 waiver is that for anyone, um, any state that is applying for it, they have to provide. MOUD inside of the jail and prison to people in the last 90 days um, before uh, they leave incarceration. And, you know, we uh, know very well the consequences uh, when people don't have access to MOUD inside of jails and prisons. Uh, you know, studies show that people are dozens of times, up to 129 times as likely to die of an overdose in the first couple of weeks out of after release. Uh, if they don't have access to MOUD. But we know also that MOUD saves lives and it decreases the risk of an overdose by about 85%. Right. So, so I want to stop you. So you're saying, but if, it, if you're not a Medicaid expansion state, because not all states in Appalachia expanded Medicaid, not all states in the United States expanded Medicaid. So if I'm not a, an, if I'm not a Medicaid expansion state, what does this mean to me? Yeah, it, it, it is, my, my understanding is that it's a requirement that uh, a state has to be a Medicaid expansion state before it can apply for this specific 1115 waiver. Um, and part of that is because of the eligibility requirements. Um, and so, you know, almost everyone in a jail and prison under Medicaid expansion would be eligible for Medicaid. It would serve a much larger population. Right. So I was I was actually I was on a call earlier today and we were talking with folks in uh, Ohio, West Virginia, uh, and I can't remember the other jurisdiction that they were from. But one of the things that they were saying was that they feel like 
each state is responding to this 1115 waiver May, is it would it be a mandate or a requirement or a request well, how how would you a law a statute how, how do you frame it number 1 and then number 2 are there consistent ways in which it has to be applied or no yeah so the federal government last year put out kind of standards for this specific 1115 waiver it is not mandatory um, you can apply if you want, and I believe it's 19 states that have applied, three states have approved, have had approval so far. So it's not mandatory. It takes a lot of negotiation between CMS, between the federal government and states. It's a big lift for a lot of states because, you know, the Medicaid, Medicare, um, government workers have to do this, have to put forward the plan. And not every state is the same in terms of what Medicaid coverage is. So it does have to be specific to that state. Mm -hmm. Joey. Yeah, and I would just add to that, that, uh, you know, I think uh, the each state is going to be different, but there are baseline requirements that are, uh, that are required by the Medicaid directory letter that was put out in April 2023, um, that kind of lays out, you know, what the minimum services required are. And that does include uh, MOUD in jail and prison context, uh, but it's so much bigger than that. And it's making sure that folks are connected to care when they get outside. Um, right. And I think that's, you know, one of the most important things that can happen is smoothing that transition process. And, you know, uh, Regina and I talk all the time about how, you know, if, we only have MOUD care inside of jails and prisons, and it's not available out in the community, then where are we going to send people when they get out? You know, over 90% of people who are incarcerated, you know, are going to uh, re-enter the community, and we need to make sure that they have access to, you know, robust care when they get outside. So, like, okay, so there are people on this call who today may be the first day they've ever heard about an 1115 waiver before, right? There are people on this call that may have heard about it, but didn't really know what it do does, right? And then there are people that are like, okay, and I got a couple of people in the chat now, like, hey, what do I do? How do I get my representative to sign on to this? So I, can, I think that's what I want you to maybe talk about from let's level set, right? So if I just learned about 1115 waivers today, what should I go and look up and know about my state or my organization? And then if I knew about 1115 waivers, but didn't know, oh, oops, it might not apply, what should I do? Or who should I be talking to in my, in my network of policy people, uh, uh, but also in my network of uh, other providers, right? Because I think, see, I think this is one of those things that providers should be talking about amongst themselves first, and then maybe taking on and taking upward. But then what would you say they need to do? What is the thing that they need to do? How would how would you tell them that they need to what's what's those three tiers of people? What what do they need to do? I want to start with the big picture and then Joey, if you could talk, fill us in. So number one, as Joey said, you know, people upon reentry, when they're when they leave a jail or prison, they're at a, a heightened risk of overdose death. And we know that providing people with uh, with treatment, evidence-based treatment, including medications for their opioid use disorder, save lives and will reduce overdose deaths. So the bottom line is that it works. We've seen it work in the state of Rhode Island, for example. And secondly, people who are incarcerated are the only group that have the right to health care in this country under a Supreme Court decision. So it's not only the right thing to do, it's it's a uh, legally <laughs> the right thing to do. And so we know it works. It will save money over time. That's tough for state legislators, for governors to say, well, over time, right now I've got a budget deficit. Um, but I think that, you know, the first step is really, if you're in a state that doesn't has an expanded Medicaid, that's the first step. The second step is, you know, making sure that a state has applied for the 1115 waiver. But the other piece is 1115 waivers are not the sole way to do this. There is legislation pending on Capitol Hill, which I believe should be passed. 
two pieces of legislation. One would allow for, for Medicaid to continue for someone who was pre-trial. So until their case was, uh, was at trial or settled, the person can continue with their Medicaid. Uh, the second one would allow for Medicaid to kick, Medicaid coverage to kick in 30 days prior to someone leaving incarceration. Again, this doesn't mean that we want to provide better treatment in jails and prisons than we do in communities. We have to have a community-based response as well as the, the right to health care that's provided in jails and prisons. And mm -hmm. Joey, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, and two other places that I would emphasize is one, you know, I, I just put a link in the chat with uh, Kaiser and Family Foundation's kind of summary of what's going on in this 1115 re-entry waiver, and it's just a wealth of information that goes state by state, what's happening, what applications are in, who does it cover, how is each state, how is each state tailoring uh, the, the 1115 application, um, but you know, 19 states have applied, 31 haven't. And uh, as you mentioned, Tony, the ones that aren't, you know, Medicaid expansion states aren't eligible to do that. Um, and so uh, to the extent that you're in a state that, you know, hasn't applied, but is eligible to apply, uh, it's really the governor's office that's going to make that call. Um, the, you know, the Medicaid director um, of each state is the one that has to apply. And so I, I really think that that's, uh, you know, one place that it makes sense to for you know, people uh, in communities to kind of talk to, get uh, you know, make sure that the state government is educated about this this opportunity that's available. And and to add on what Regina said um, about uh, the, the state level as well is you know th this is not the only option. There's federal legislation that Regina mentioned, but there's also opportunities through state legislation. We've seen state legislation. Um, that has required access to MOUD in jails and prisons in New York and in New Mexico. Um, we've seen executive action in Ohio. Um, so there's really a lot of exciting movement. Um, and I'll put in the chat a uh, state model law um, that uh, the Legislative Analysis and Public Policy Association put out um, that you know lays out how states can go about uh, expanding access to MOUD in congressional settings. All right, so all right, so wait, I want, I want, I want to recap. I want to recap. You know, again, remember, we we're just here by ourselves, and you know, so if, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have to. You know, I always say, if I'm the smartest one in the room, I'm in the wrong room. So here's the thing. All right, so number one, you need to be a Medicaid expansion state for these 1115 waivers, right? So we can put a we uh, Lavina or Lee or somebody. Can you put a link in the chat for which states in the United States have expanded Medicaid or the ones in Appalachia or whomever, however you want to do it? So that's number one. But number two, you're saying that even if you haven't expanded Medicaid, there's a way. There's a, there's a way to have this conversation, and the way to have that conversation is probably with your governor's office because that's where. A, le a different legislative lever can be pulled to begin to have this conversation. The overall benefit to the 1115 waiver is to ensure that people that are in our jails, not is it jails and prisons or prisons and jails? And I want to they can tailor they can tailor it to be both or either or. Okay, so jails and prisons within that 90 day, in that 90 day pre-release window, have access to buprenorphine, suboxone, whatever it is that they need, then they have enough to get them out when they come home for at least 90 days. Am I understanding this correctly, right? That's, that's, that's basically it. I'm not, I'm not sure about if it's 90 days after release. I think it's a 30 day, generally a 30 day supply of medications upon release. Okay. Um, but yes, that's that's basically it. Okay, so now I'm out. So I'm out. So the question that I think people are going to have is, what happens after that? Am I supposed to be partnered up with a service provider by that point? Is there a transition point at that point? So that's I think one question people are going to have. And I think the other question that people are going to have is, what happens if they don't? If they decide no, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to sign up for this eleven fifteen. I think that, like uh, Regina said earlier, hey, you know, look, there's a cost here. 
this is going to cost money. Now, I think that, you know, kind of having folks have an overdose death is, is probably more of a, you know, human cost. But what is, what do I say to a governor's office? What do I say to a state health department about why I think that they should do this in a cost benefit analysis, right? Like, I mean, every, I think every state, red, blue, purple, is interested in reducing overdose deaths. And we, we've seen that this helps reduce overdose deaths because we know that upon reentry, people are a, a greatly heightened risk of overdose. So if we can help them get the care that they need as they're entering the community, I, I would argue they need it throughout their incarceral their carceral setting, but that's another story. Um, if you connect people with care so that they go in the community, they're they're not going to overdose. They have much much lower risk of overdose. They have a much lower risk of recidivism, of committing another crime, and they have a much better chance of extending re their their recovery over time. So that all adds up to cost savings taxpayer savings, government savings, and, and just a saving in human lives. Now, how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we prove that, right? I mean, how, I mean, where is, is there a, you know, a financial analysis that says this is the, if this is so, right? You know, is like, is it, you know, is it, is there a, you know, a healthcare finance report that says, Yes, if you do this, you save money versus we think so, or you know, hypothetically, if you do this, that'll happen. But is there is it have some has somebody done like a financial analysis? I know, I mean, I know y'all had Holt Grave over there for a while, uh, at the Office of National Drug Control Policy. And if y'all don't know, like uh David Holt Grave is like one of my favorite people on the planet. And if, you know, if nobody can tell you how much something costs, if he can't tell you, nobody can, is how I always say it. So I don't know if that's what he did over there or if there's another way for us to be able to, to quantify how much how much money do we save, either per life or per incident or per, or I mean, how do, how do, we, how do we make this argument? So the state of Rhode Island has done research on this. They were the, one of the first states and they showed um, that when they implemented medications for opioid use disorder in their jails and prisons, now they're a unified system, so they only have one, you know, director who's in charge of all their jails and prisons. Rhode Island is a pocket-sized state; we know that, but they reduced overdose deaths in that population by sixty percent. And so we do know that it works from the research that's been done in Rhode Island. However, I think that every, we're looking at this now, I do think that every state is going to have to look at what are the best practices, how is it working? States, as Joey said, don't have to wait for 1115 waivers. You know, they can do it themselves now. So almost every New England state has been implementing, has implemented MOUD in all their jails and prison system. Um, and that research is, you know, how long it takes for research. But Rhode Island's is the is kind of at the forefront right now in the research that's been done. Joey, did you have anything you wanted to add there? Yeah, I, I think Regina basically covered it. But I think that a lot of this research, you know, I mean, as I mentioned when I introduced myself, when I was, uh, you know, doing this work in 2018, ju just a handful of jails and prisons had done, you know, had implemented MOUD in jails and prisons. So I think the um, my understanding is that there is some data, I don't have it offhand, um, on cost benefit analysis. Um, however, uh, there's going to be more data coming, um, you know, as this practice expands and as there continues to be more, you know, attention on this issue. Yeah. All right. I'm going to ask you, there's a couple of questions in the chat and I'm going to ask those before I pivot over to my, for, for my, my workforce, cause I'm going to combine. So get your minds right, get your minds ready. I'm going to combine ADA and workforce development, and I and I and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, but get yourselves ready. Okay. The question is: Are there differences in overdose deaths post incarceration based on length of sentence and time in jail or prison? I would suggest that it is more it more often occurs with persons being released 
from jails. Is and the majority of the work that we've done has focused on jails because the majority of people are in jail. I'll tell you the one thing that's really disturbing, though, that, you know, if you so some states have like uh, made county jails implement this, but haven't done it at the at the prison setting. And so someone could be in a holding cell or could be receiving MOUD in a jail, and then they're transferred to a state prison where they're not receiving MOUD, and that increases their risk of overdose death. So yes, it is more often uh, in jail. We focus quite a bit on jail, but the fact is the American Disabilities Act, the American Re Rehabilitation Act, you know, and the right to treatment, um, that, that transcends whether you're a jail or a prison. But yes, the majority of the work that we've done and that's going on nationwide is in jails. Right, and so I, I'm gonna, uh, actually I'm gonna pivot to a couple of questions. Regina, when we started, you said that you got a grant to do some work. What work did you get a grant to do? So the work that we've done, um, so from Arnold Ventures, we've done, uh, we've had, a, we do a lot of research. We have, as Joey said, we work to develop some model state laws. We bring do a lot of convenings. We bring together um, sheriffs as well as public health professionals to, you know, kind of bridge that gap so that people understand the importance of this. Uh, we've put out, you know, reports that and and also have done some original research that's been um, in peer reviewed journals about the risk of death, withdrawal deaths for people upon entry. Um, and so we do a lot of the, you know, kind of the quick takes and big idea documents that we can then give to policymakers to inform them about the importance of these types of policies. So that's kind of the work that we do. Okay. And Joey, what, what are you working on now, these days? Yeah, I'm working um, primarily on kind of connecting, uh, you know, doing capacity building for more litigation to happen in this space to vindicate the rights of people under the Americans with Disabilities Act, not just in jails and prisons, uh, but kind of expanding that outwards towards, you know, folks that are discriminated against in going to nursing homes or long-term care facilities. We're talking about, um, you know, folks in uh, employment settings or uh, folks that are denied licenses uh, because they're using MOUD. Uh, you know, the case law that we've established really does expand outwards beyond jails and prisons. Regina did mention that, you know, the only place that you have right to health care um, in America is in a jail or prison, but that doesn't mean that uh, people are free to, to discriminate against you on the basis of a disability. Uh, and so that's uh, the kind of focus of my work right now. So thank you, thank you both. And, and, I, and, I, and the reason I wanted to ask this question is because I'm gonna lead into my next question. I mean, I know that Joey, you came to the summit. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shame or shade Regina for not coming to our Syndemic Summit in Appalachia. I know that she will make it next time. Uh, I, I, I just, I, I just know, I just got a feeling in my bones it's going to happen the next time. Um, but one of the things that I'm really focused on and want to figure out is, you know, we have our community health worker model for people with lived experience, our Champs program, where we train community health workers to do HIV screening, Hep C screening, prep uptake, and link folks to care. And some of those folks are folks with lived experience around substance use disorder. But the real issue for me is when, you know, we start to talk about things like, quote unquote, second chance employers, it, bur it burns my shorts. It really and truly does. Because it's like, I'm like, these are like, we shouldn't be talking about second chance employers. We should be talking about how we get people careers. Right. You know, and, you know, I, I will I will take a little moderator license and, you know, Joey probably heard it 15 times during the summit. I don't know if uh, Regina's ever heard it, but here we go. Here goes the train, everybody. I like to say that there's a, a train that's roaring through Appalachia. The engine of that train is the Oxycontin crisis that we used to know, but it's now a poly drug use crisis. The next car on that train is hepatitis C, hepatitis B, hepatitis A educational attainment challenges, workforce development challenges, economic development challenges, and the caboose of that train being HIV. And we need to imagine that train laden down with coal, the environmental impact of coal, 
the economic impact of coal and the psychological impact of lost coal jobs. So as I look around the Appalachia region, what I've got to figure out is how I get folks who are having, who are now experienced lived experience, and maybe they are on MOUD, how do I get them jobs that are in manufacturing plants? How do I get them jobs that are in construction? How do I get them jobs that are in folk, in places where there might be machinery? And so, you know, I was talking to a guy, and I don't know if you heard him, Joey, while he was at the summit, but he has a place called Brooks House. Now, the women that are in his program are getting jobs at, uh, uh, at on construction sites, getting jobs uh, in manufacturing, getting jobs in unions. So, but when we think about these second chance employers, many of them say, no, 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 level of risk way too high for me to get someone who is on uh, MOUD. Help me understand under the Americans with Disabilities Act, what are people's rights? What are the conversations that we need to be having with unions and others to talk about careers and not second chance employers, that kind of thing. I think about career opportunities because I think that's one of the other things that keep people out of overdose scenarios is employment, jobs, money, being able to pay for their families. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, folks that are on MOUD, uh, the ADA does apply uh, in employment context, Title I of the ADA, uh, you know, and you can't discriminate against uh, somebody, a qualified person with a disability. Uh, and, you know, the, the big exception to that is uh, if somebody is currently using illegal drugs. Um, but MOUD is not, uh, you know, an illegal drug. It's, uh, you know, prescribed by a physician or dispensed by an OTP. Um, and, you know, to the extent that there's uh, discrimination happening and it's happening because of uh, somebody's disability, their substance use disorder, their medication that they're taking for their opioid use disorder, uh, you know, that is a violation of the law. And, uh, you know, people should do as much documentation that they can. Uh, I think, you know, in a lot of states around the country, there's a lot of, you know, at will employment and uh, people can get fired through virtually any, uh, you know, legitimate reason. This is not one of the legitimate reasons. Um, but, you know, if you can get proof uh, that, you know, this was the reason why uh, you, you know, you were uh, fired from your job, or you didn't get hired from a job, then that's something that, uh, you know, there is legal recourse for. And one of the things that we're trying to do at the O'Neill Institute and through, you know, Georgetown is to kind of build more of a pipeline of uh, civil rights attorneys, employment lawyers, other folks who are mindful of these issues and ready to vindicate people's rights in court. Right. So I want to um, add to Joey's, you know, great description of the ADA coverage. You know, construction trades have some of the highest overdose death rates in the country, morbidity and mortality. So people, you know, who work in the construction trades. The other point that's really important is that 70% of people with substance use disorder, they're already working. They're in the workplace now. We know that. So the issue of safety sensitive workers, workplaces, that's very important. And we need to make sure that people and you know people may their methadone dose may not be correct. Um, those are things that have to be worked out between the clinician and the employee. There are a lot of states in the country, Kentucky, New Hampshire, uh, a number of other states that have recovery ready workplaces. Now, recovery ready workplaces, the point of that started in New Hampshire because they had like a zero percent you know, unemployment rate. They really needed workers. And they wanted to make sure that both the employer and the employee, the employee had, you know, was able to get uh, their, you know, treatment, to get accommodations for time off if they needed it, to get their treatment. But the employer also understood not only their responsibilities, but also how to work, how to create a workforce that is effective for the employee and for the employer mm. uh, so that retention rates are up. So if we look at it kind of in a flip way, it's like, it's like doctors who say, I don't wanna treat people with addiction. Well, you know what, you already are. Yeah. 
-hmm. So employers who say, I don't want to hire people who have, who, you know, may have an addiction, they're already in your workplace. They're just not talking to you about it. And they may have higher rates of absenteeism, but once they get into treatment, their absenteeism rates go way down. So it's building those recovery ready workplaces. This is another area we've done some work work on. on. We have a journal article about that. We have a quick take because we have to also understand, you know, the employer wants employees who are going to show up and they may not understand. There's so much stigma, so much shame, so much, so many misunderstandings and employees and employers are, you know, are no, are not exempt from that. So we need to give them the support that they need to build these workplaces. Uh, so okay, so but, all right, so all right, all right. You, you, you say all of that, but now I now I got to go talk to Joe, right? And Joe has a factory, and Joe is in the middle of Appalachia, right? And Joe's like, Mm-mm, nope, yep. because what I'm afraid of, and I mean, I'm gonna tell you what Joe's gonna tell me that they're afraid of. Joe's afraid that this person is gonna come to work high one day and stick their hand in a machine. And I'm gonna get sued by the employer and the employee, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna have blood all over my floor, and I don't know what I'm doing, and I just think that I, I'd rather be ignorant to Joe the, to the use than I would to have a program in place or or a workplace in place that has all of the controls in place that that I need. What do I say to these employers to say, hey? First of all, you need to hire employees. And I and I say it's everywhere from Main Street to the manufacturing floor, especially in rural communities, whether that's the restaurant that needs workers, and that's one set of challenges around people with lived experience in alcohol, et cetera. But that's one piece. But also in the manufacturing sector that is also out often found in rural communities. What do I say to them? What do I what do I say to them? What is the program that I say, no, here, look, there's this government program. This will help you find employees. What do I do? Well, there's there are some tax credits. I'm going to put this in the chat, the recovery ready workplace piece that we did. There are some tax credits that help fire, help hire people under Second Chance Act. Some states have tax credits as well uh, to retain employees. Um, Massachusetts has some materials for employees and, and employers about how to work with people in recovery, you know, but, but again, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm from New England. I grew up in a rural area. I worked in factories. And let me tell you, people who think that everybody in factories who are working don't have, aren't using substances has never worked on a factory floor because they are. And those employers know that. So, you know, these are programs that are in place that can really help employers. Um, So I'll put in the chat our journal article, but also information about Massachusetts um, that has, you know, all these materials and, you know, for to support employers who need to hire people and they're they're working with you know, the construction uh, trades as well as the construction companies are working together uh, in this effort. And I think it's just to add on to that, I think it's really important that, you know, we just have a workplace culture where people can, to the extent that they're comfortable, talk openly about, you know, their experience in recovery. Um, because right now, uh, you know, people are afraid that they're going to get fired, that they won't be able to find a job. Uh, you know, the, the unemployment statistics for people with, you know, it's, it's not directly related, but for people with a criminal background. Um, you know, it's, it's the unemployment rate is, is quite high. And so, you know, it's absolutely crucial um, that for people who are in recovery, that they're able to, you know, uh, to the extent that the company will talk about it, but also just be able to have a workplace um, that, you know, isn't stigmatizing towards, uh, you know, people who are in recovery. This, this, as Regina said, the statistics are, you know, pretty stunning. And, uh, you know, if you have a workplace that's, you know, larger than a handful of people, you already do have people in recovery um, who are in your workplace. And it's important that, you know, we put the supports and the services that they need um, so that they're able to succeed instead of pushing it down and hoping that it doesn't become a problem. The problems that, you know, you, you mentioned, Tony, um, you know, a lot less likely to happen um, if there's, uh, you know, a workplace that's uh, able to be 
to be open about it and to be openly supportive of people in recovery. Maybe not those, you know, individually naming who it is as much as it is, you know, building a culture where, uh, you know, people support each other. So, I mean, I, I think that one of the things that I want to ask you also is kind of to reverse engineer this a bit. What is it that many of the many of the organizations and individuals that are on this call are providers of one sort or another, right? So what can they do to locally with their local city council, local government, local or even their members of Congress, what can they do to support either the 1115 waiver piece or the work the recovery piece? And I'm going to talk about one more piece around MAP providers, but I, I want you both to kind of also give us a charge too, right? Give us out here a charge too, because yeah, we're all busy with our sleeves rolled up doing the direct service work, but then, you know, at the end of the day, you come to us and say, well, you know, Congress needs to hear from you, but you know, okay, but what do they, I mean, what are we going to tell them that we're working hard and that we don't have enough money to do the job that we need to do, but what do we really need to be telling? I guess there's a couple things. One is, you know, making sure you're telling the stories of what's working uh, because the solution to this doesn't lie in Washington, DC, it lies in communities. So making sure that you're telling the story of what's working so that that can be applied nationwide uh, or in communities similar. Um, the other piece I think is important uh, is to, as much as possible, uh, attend or at least write in to the litigation. So you mentioned the opioid litigation councils, the opioid lit litigation commissions. Um, you know, not every state has a commission, but most states do. That's an opportunity for input into how the money should be spent. It does vary, like North Carolina has a nice website with information about where the money's going. Like that's over now, you know, started last year, the money will be spent over an 18 year period. That's gonna be really important for states, for community members to stay on top of where that money's going, particularly in uh, local, well, how the local governments are spending the money. Cause as you know, they're they're getting money uh, local governments are are getting money. They may or may not have a good relationship with their public health community. They may not know how to spend it. So I would I would start with, you know, making sure you're showing up that that the commissions, the councils know that people are paying attention to where that money's going, um, and you know, making sure that it's going to to supplement what's already happening. Not to just take away, well, you know, the government doesn't have to spend this money anymore. We've got this windfall from the opioid litigation. Um, you know, spending it on methadone vans or vans, mobile units. It doesn't even have to have methadone on it, but mobile units so people can get the help they need in their communities. Right. Now, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, you know, here's the thing. I, the opioids, I, I, here's what I think, you know, and I, know, I was going to say nobody cares what I think, but I guess that's kind of why y'all are all, all kind of here. Right? But so here's the thing is that when it comes to opioid settlements, opioid remediation, you know, we've got, I think, I think one of the largest fanciest, not so fancy dashboard, not like North Carolina, of data collected on kind of what's happening in the Appalachia region. But I think that the, the greatest challenge I, I see is I just keep thinking in my brain, and I, and again, if I'm the smartest person in the room, I'm in the wrong room. But I keep thinking, all right, I know that the opioid settlement dollars are by decree through the court. But at some point, I got to believe that SAMHSA and these opioid settlement folk have to have a conversation because if I've got all of this money coming into state X or county Y, to do X, to do A, B, C, D, and E, at some point, SAMHSA has to say, is our money, which is probably either going to be equal to, greater than, or less than, is it going to complement what's going on? Is it going to not supplement, but supplant what's going on? Or at some point, who's going to be looking at it and saying, wait a minute, hey, wait a minute, what are we doing? 
with our federal resource on top of this resource? And how are they complementary? How are they complementary? How do we make sure that we're getting the most bang for our buck? Because that money that's coming out of opioid settlements is coming through AG's offices. Some cases they're giving money to the state health department. Some cases they're giving it to the county health department. Some cases the health departments are engaged. Some cases they may not be. So we got to figure this piece of this puzzle out too. I mean, but that's just my nickel's worth of thought. What do y'all think? Uh oh, you went on mute. Okay, Lugina, go ahead. Yeah, I think you got this. So, Tony, the the issue of the federal government having uh, the federal government doesn't have to direct where the money's going, but the federal government, as the largest funder of services for individuals nationwide for prevention, for treatment, etc., needs to know where this money is going. And right now, it is not doing that. I'm no longer with the federal government, so I can say that. Uh, and the best, so, uh, but, so individual agencies like SAMHSA, your regional person is very good, is really paying attention to a lot of it. Um, so the SAMHSA regional offices are looking at how the money is coordinated and whether the money is coordinated. But I believe strongly there is a bigger role to play for the federal government to play, not in directing the money, but at least in knowing what's going on. Because right now it's, you all have a great website with a lot of information, but all this is like, we're, we're nickel and diming this, you know, we're bake sailing like we do on all of our continuum of care. It's a bake sale approach to these issues when it should be, you know, an ongoing oversight role of where the money's going so it can be spent in complementary ways. And that is not happening right now. Right. And that and that's kind of my that's kind of my nickels worth. My nickels worth isn't I'm not trying to run in and say, oh, you should have federal oversight. Oh, there should be federal oversight. That's I'm not like doing a I'm not having like a henny penny moment, you know, but I am saying, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't make two bags worth of sense to me. If you, the federal government, as you stated, you know, are the largest funder of this, and you have a whole big bag of money that you're about to spend. And we're not saying, oh, wait a minute, we don't need, you know, more of that because we are getting ready to spend it on that. Or that if you're going to spend it on that, okay, well, we're going to make some changes over here with this, you know? And I think that that's the piece where I'm just like, this is bananas. And as you said, it's like, it's an 18 year process, right? So, and, and but I think the big chunks of this dough is going to be spent in many cases on the front end. Right. And so if you're front loading, you're going to build a new treatment center. You're going to do major construction projects. You're going to do major infrastructure projects. And then you want what? Samson to come back with what? Healthy, a healthy communities initiative. You want a hundred thousand dollar grant. I mean, doesn't, I mean, who do we talk to? Do you think we talk to the feds on that, because uh, I know that the feds have a, a, a syndemic work group that's supposed to be across all the federal agencies. Who, who do people talk to to say in my town or in my state, I want better coordination of these resources or I want you to think about these resources? Do they reach out to their regional SAMHSA person? Do they call the regional resource coordinator in their, in their, in their regional office of the federal government? I don't know. I think starting with the SAMHSA regional director is good, regional people, and then, you know, the members of Congress, um, you know, did, there have been letters written to members of Congress asking, you know, what's going on. Um, there, there should, you know, they, the Congress could put money in that says that's, that some entity has to have authority over this and some oversight on it. Um, so members of Congress, as well as the regional SAMHSA administrators. All right. Okay. Now, now I know we are late. I'm because I okay. I would I'd like to blame Joey and and Regina, but I cannot. Uh, and so you know, I'm I'm learning account. I'm learning accountability. Uh, and so uh, I'll take my accountability. So hopefully you'll be kind and give me a few extra minutes. And the folks, the folks have to leave. I understand that uh, as well. 
one of the things that I really want to talk to you about, because it's a it's a passion project of mine, it's a passion uh, of mine, is that I believe that we have got to get medically assisted treatment providers as a part of our continuum of HIV, hepatitis C care, and PrEP uptake. I, I believe, and this is, you know, I mean, you know, because I believe it doesn't make it true, but I always make it sound like it's so. So what I believe is that MAP providers, that's MA, the buprenorphine, suboxone, methadone providers in this country are where that 20, 25% of HIV cases, 50% of hepatitis C cases that we say we can't find in this country. I think that they're sitting right there. And I think that we have done a really good job of saying, you're not a part of, you know, the, the, the Gardner Cascade. You're a behavioral health provider. That's what you are. But rather than doing the work I think we need to do to say, no, 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 no. Don't let those folks opt out of an HCV test. Don't let those folks opt out of an HIV test. And oh, and by the way, let's talk to them about PrEP. And I think that we want to talk to them about PrEP for a couple of reasons. One, you know, I think that what we have learned over the last few years is that 90% of gay white men in this country who are PrEP eligible have a PrEP prescription in their pocket or have, uh, or have access to PrEP. Now, the question is, where are these other cases that we would need to talk to? Some would argue that it is in Black men who have sex with men. I think that that's one, one cohort. But I also think that we have not done a whole bunch to maybe engage with people who use drugs in this country with PrEP and PrEP education. I think that folks that often, you know, we talk to some of the rural health departments and then one of the challenges that they have is that folks with lived substance use disorder experience don't see themselves in those ads. They don't see themselves as a part of the outreach. So talk to me about how I, how we, especially those of us working in rural communities, I, you know, I gave you my train analogy and my job, I think our job is to, is to stop that train in its tracks, right? By bringing resources, opportunity and attention to the region and particularly to, to rural groups. So how do I begin to have this conversation with MAP providers about it's you, 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 are, you are the goal you are my threshold. You are where I have got to go. You are where I have to, I have to infiltrate that social, sexual, drug sharing and treatment and cure network of that MAP provider and the people that are going in there. Tell me, what do I do? Well, I think, I think one thing that, you know, really connects to the 1115 way is that you know, if Wu Ku biting MOUD in jails and prisons is kind of the foothold of Medicaid in jails and prisons, we need to have a future where there's Medicaid oversight over the healthcare that's Wu bited in jails and prisons. And that includes a much more kind of comprehensive set of services like the ones that you're talking about. Um, and so if I think we can get a foothold um, into, you know, oversight of jails and prisons instead of these kind of ad hoc class action lawsuits in, you know, you know, pro adult at a jail and prison that is, you know, violating the constitution by not providing adequate health care, um, then that's, you know, one really important piece of this. And then, you know, it's really important that that transition uh, into the community from jails and prisons, you know, includes that quality health care as well. So I think that's, you know, absolutely critically important. Tony, one of the issues that you raised, which I think was one of the uh, in in the comments is, you know, that people may not identify that they don't see themselves. Um, I know that's, you know, that's often the case that we've seen in in the District of Columbia, which has the second highest rate of overdose death in the country if it were a state. Um, so it's integrating care conversations, discussions and conferences like you had about the endemic. Uh, syndemic issues so people can cross pollinate and learn from one another. You know, we don't have, I mean, the addiction medicine only became a specialty in the last few years. So it's not like we have this huge, vast array of people who are turning uh, people away for this. Um, but we do live in states, in regions 
that don't have drug user health facilities, which could be a perfect place for that. New York does. Washington State is um, has some of that low barrier uh, treatment facilities so that people can get help in an array of, of ways. And then syringe services programs are inaptly named because there's so much more. They really are facilities that provide health care across the board. So it's, you know, it's it's breaking down those barriers to getting people the help that they need in the at the lowest barrier level that they can get it. There is legislation pending on the Hill that would allow for more pilot programs of drug user health facilities. There's another name for it that I can't remember, but you know, it, it, it's going to take a while, but I think that, you know, it, as long as we keep working together, managing the successes that we've had and identifying those barriers and breaking them down, that's really the way to go about it. So you, all right, and, and uh, we've got five minutes left. I think folks, uh, we have been chit-chatting away in the chat. I guess that's why they made their chat, huh? Um, but at any rate, uh, here's the thing. What I want to close on is this. My question for the two of you is this. You're not in government anymore, right? The DARE program has been gaining momentum. Please don't say that. Um, but, um, but given what you both do and what you've both seen, what is your hope? What is your hope for the movement around harm reduction, the movement around economic development, workforce development? What is your hope that this country will do policy-wise to make sure that it is protecting people with substance use disorder in this country? What is your hope? Sorry, why don't you go first and then... Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, we've seen implementation of evidence-based policies, um, you know, whether that be SSPs, whether that be, uh, you know, the access to MOUD in jails and prisons, we're seeing results, we're seeing people's lives saved. And my hope is in, uh, you know, the people who, uh, you know, directly impacted by this issue, who, um, you know, are able to live full, healthy, robust, joyful lives, um, you know, when they get out of jail and prison, when they have, uh, you know, the kind of uh, job, uh, work life, career that you're talking about, Tony, um, you know, we're having, uh, you know, a, a family life, um, and, you know, uh, 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 you know, all of the, the hopes, dreams, and aspirations that any of us have, are possible to them because uh, you know they had access to basic healthcare, uh, and I really think that's what we're fighting for. Um, and so, you know, uh, it's really you know one of the biggest honors and privileges of my life is being able to work. One of the things I love about the law is I work with individual clients, and I get to hear their stories. I get to talk to them about their families, about their kids, um, and the way the things that they've had to overcome, but also you know the the ways that they've been able to, uh, you know, thrive, uh, and I'm excited to see them lead the way. Perfect. I mean, I think I'm hopeful because there's so many good people working on this issue, and so many committed individuals, you know, who are um, entering recovery every day, who remain committed to improving the lives of others. So I'm hopeful because of that. My hope is that we are, despite the politics of the moment, that we can rise above the politics of the moment mm. and that we take a nonpartisan approach to this. Drug policy is never at its best when, when it's partisan mm. and it doesn't have to be. Uh, and we can make change when we can meet each other. If 42% of people in the country know someone who died of an overdose, that is reflected on Capitol Hill and in every state house around the country. So if we can reach out to them, make sure people are based in science and evidence and try to find that common ground where we're not politicizing it, that's what my hope is. 
Well, thanks. You know, I, you know, you, you hit on the, an issue in that last comment that I, I also really believe. I believe until we actually do the work, which also addresses the trauma of a lot of our elected officials. Because sometimes when I, I see a crazy policy or I see an arcane policy, you know, I'm like, it's not just their politics. I'm like, this is rooted in something else. This is rooted in somebody they know. This is rooted in something that happened to them. This is rooted in, you know, a person that they know overdosed. This is rooted in a person that they know had a negative experience. This is so until we are also willing to, I think, begin to unpack for them what some of that trauma is that they have uh, in there and in, in ultimately impacting their decision making. I don't know how we do it. I don't know how we get them to, to own up to it, like kind of what it is that's personal for them too. But I really do think that that's a part of how we've got to change some of these systems is the people that are making some of these decisions have to own up to their own lived experience, which is not necessarily that they're the ones that had the problem. They saw the problem. They lived through the problem. And that's why it's called lived experience. Because it's not just that you have to be the person that has the, has been using drugs. It's, it's the emotional and the psychological and the familial and the communal impact. Because again, if we think about Appalachia, right? 30 years, 30 years of dealing with a crisis. There's no way that this hasn't impacted you, your family, whether you're an elected, whether you're a dog catcher or whether you're the governor. Doesn't matter. It's got to have impacted your family, your social, your, your familial network, your communal network in some way. And we got to figure out ways to have these other conversations. All right. Listen, again, I apologize humbly for being late. I want to thank you so much for taking time out. We've had a really busy and robust chat. I think that also at some point we may have to do this again, but also let's do it. Think about doing it in a Facebook live or something like that. Because I think there's a lot of interest in this topic. Uh, and you two are super stuff. You know, remember that? You remember that? Super stuff. From Saturday Night Live. You're super stuff. So I want to thank you uh, both for taking out an hour and more uh, of your day to spend with us. Uh, we have, uh, I think, collected most of the links that you'll get, you've sent. We will send those out to all the folks that are call, on the call. But we'll also put it out in our newsletter. Uh, as well. Again, Regina, Joey, thank you so, so very much, not just for joining this call, but for the work that you do and your commitment to this issue, uh, because it's not for the faint of heart. As I, I like to say, the syndemic is not for the faint of heart. This is whether, and people, if people only knew the politics of what you deal with in your, in your daily, daily lives, I do, I, I understand. And so thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Tony. Appreciate it. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Have a great week.